This video will explain the story of God of War Ragnarok. The plan is to talk about both the main story and ending, as well as any mythology that we happen to run across. I read Neil Gaiman's version of Norse mythology in order to understand some of Ragnarok, but I do know that it's not 100% accurate to the original text, but it does seem to at least keep the general idea intact. As always, spoiler warning ahead as this covers the whole story of Ragnarok, but I'll also be referencing some of the events from God of War 2018 and some of the Greek games as well to provide some context. I want to keep this intro as short as possible, but before we start I want to let you know that I have dozens of other story explanation videos like this on other games, but if you're looking for more opinionated pieces, I have lots of story reviews on a plethora of games and series, including all of the God of War games in one video. So if that sounds entertaining to you, then feel free to stick around after you watch this video. With that out of the way though, let's get started. So God of War Ragnarok takes place three years after God of War 2018. Fimble Winter, the three year long winter that started after we killed Baldur back in the last game, is now in full effect, but it's foretold that Ragnarok shortly follows after its three year reign. Kratos has gotten older, and so has Atreus. Atreus seems to be able to hold his own now as he has just returned from hunting, and Kratos is also showing more wrinkles, which conveys his age and possibly that he's getting weaker over time. The two then set off home before being interrupted by Freya, who has come for her revenge. They manage to get by unscathed as they make it inside the protection stave. This spell might operate a bit differently from Faye's protection spell. Faye's was used to hide their presence, and the same might be true here, but it also seems to prevent people from entering entirely. I find it hard to believe that Freya doesn't know where they live since they've been here for over three years, so maybe it's stopping her from entering. When the two fight a few raiders later, Atreus mentions how they must have snuck in while the stave was down, so it seems to operate like a shield that no one but them can enter. Freya also attacks them, which is odd as she was cursed not to harm anything, but we learn that when Fimblewinter arrived, the curses on her weakened a bit. Once Kratos and Atreus make it home, we see more of the new family, that being three wolves, Specky, Svana, and Fenrir. Specky and Svana are two wolves that pulled the sled and were found one day when they were out hunting. The two then rescued the wolves from a group of raiders and they've been with them ever since. According to the Codex, Fenrir was already on the decline when they met them. This of course leads to today when Atreus says his final goodbyes to Fenrir before he passes. Fenrir's soul is then seen leaving his body before going into the sky. We learn eventually that Atreus has a knife that can carry a soul in it, which will then be used later once the two meet Garm. Afterward, we get into this entry's game-long argument. Whereas in 2018, Atreus and Kratos argued over Atreus' skill and attitude, it's now about Atreus wanting to learn about Loki and how the two have a lack of trust. Kratos wants to protect Atreus and make sure he is safe, while Atreus wants to explore the realms and figure out who Loki is and what he should be doing. These ideals conflict, which is why Atreus sneaks out all the time. Kratos then goes inside, talks to Bamir, who is still with the group, and then goes to bed. Kratos will experience quite a few dreams like this throughout the game, all of which revolve around Faye, who finally shows her face for the first time in the series. The dream is fine for a time until Faye seems to change character a bit and tells Kratos that time is running out. Kratos can't seem to catch a break, as right after this he sets off to find Atreus, as he was supposed to bury Fenrir but hasn't returned. Kratos then finds a bear, which he almost kills before discovering that it is Atreus. Loki in the mythology is a shapeshifter, as he took the appearance of a salmon, bird, and a horse at one point. Atreus, at least within the bounds of the game, seems to only be able to transform into a bear and then later a wolf. I can imagine though that with time, he will be able to transform into more animals. Once the two return home, a one-to-one -one recreation of the last game's ending is shown, which means Thor is here to play. Despite what the last game made us think, he's not actually here to fight, but rather talk. As he enters, two ravens enter with him, which means Odin is watching, and sure enough, he arrives shortly after. These birds are Hungin and Munin. They're a little bit different from the ravens we've seen around the game, as they're not only stored on his arm in the form of tattoos, but they specifically, according to the myth, go around the realms providing Odin with information. Odin sits down with the group and talks about the past events. Odin is not upset at the fact that Kratos killed Magni and Modi, but he is upset that he killed Baldur. Odin calls the brothers useless, which bothers Thor. Thor is shown to be quite the broken man in this game. He, like Atreus, has a father with impossibly high expectations that he will never reach. Atreus and Kratos inevitably recognize this and talk about it, but Odin doesn't. He always tells Thor how he's a much better person when he doesn't think. Thor is very upset that his sons have died, but doesn't say anything as it will anger Odin. Odin came here to the home to broker peace, because Odin just wants to find answers, which we'll talk about in a moment, but also because Atreus keeps searching for Tyr, something Kratos was unaware of. Odin offers peace, and while that would be something Kratos would want, as he wants to stop fighting and protect Atreus, the man who asked for peace is not to be trusted, so he declines. This then leads to the fight between Thor and Kratos. According to the dialogue during the fight, it seems that Sigrun being rescued was canon, and that the story of the Ghost of Sparta is indeed a widespread tale that the gods of these realms are familiar with. 
During the fight, Thor and Kratos enter a stalemate that ends up with Kratos getting killed, but then gets revived shortly after as Thor uses Mjolnir as a defibrillator. This seems to be an intended game mechanic, but only a one-time use, as I died after this and Thor didn't revive me again. This also technically means that Thor is now the third member of the I Killed Kratos Club, just behind Ares and Zeus. Kratos then rages and socks Thor in the face, which according to him was a sufficient enough blood payment for his son's death, so he leaves. Brock and Sindri come by after the fight and take Kratos back home. While Kratos and Thor were fighting, Odin was talking with Atreus and asked if he wanted to come to Asgard with him. We also learn that Odin doesn't really care much about Jotunheim anymore, as he's focused on something else. As we briefly mentioned, Atreus was searching for Tyr. This goes back to him wanting to find out more about Loki, the Giants, and Ragnarok. While searching for answers, he visited those old Jotnar shrines from the previous game and found out that they have a secret room behind the panels. Each one has a more detailed and truthful story of the beings on the panels. Inside, we see the story of Skull and Hati. From the previous game, we learn that Skull and Hati chase the moon and sun, which is why the world has a day-night cycle. Odin captured them because it's prophesized that once the wolves devour their target, Ragnarok will begin. That's what the panel says, but inside the shrine, it shows the giants taking the wolves back and releasing them. The wolves are now in Vanaheim, safe from Odin, but eventually the moon will get stolen. Someone then comes by, puts the moon back, and shoots an arrow into the sky, returning the wolves back to how they were. This, of course, is exactly what happens later in the game when we go to Vanaheim. This leads to the final part, which shows Tyr leading the armies of the realms against Odin. To Atreus, this means that Tyr is alive and is just locked up somewhere. After discussing it a bit, they determine that he might be in Svalterheim, home of the dwarves. To get there, though, they need to visit Sindri, who lives in the realm between realms. Inside here is also Ratatoskr, the messenger of the World Tree. We also learn why he's so different in God of War 2018. One of Atreus' spectral summons was a talking squirrel, which was one of Ratatoskr's spectral aspects called Bitter. On the way to Tyr, the two meet Durlin, who was a part of a rebellion that Fae had led. She, along with the dwarves, went against Asgard since Odin used them quite often to produce various devices for him, but according to Durlin, the rebellion failed. After a long walk, the two find Tyr, the Norse god of war. But as we know, that is not Tyr, but rather Odin posing as Tyr. We can find the real Tyr later after the game is over, and that conversation confirms that Tyr wasn't switched out at some point, but was never there to begin with. This was Odin from the very start. The biggest question, though, is how is this possible? How can he be Odin and Tyr? Honestly, I'm not really sure how he pulled this off, but he does have the raven, so he likely teleported back to Asgard when no one was looking. This is a little odd, though, because Atreus goes to Asgard and is gone for quite a long time, yet no one questions what Tyr was doing during that time. This may have been intentional, though, because Tyr is not a very important character in this game. He just kind of exists, and will acknowledge us when at the table. This would be helpful for Odin, since Tyr would be so useless to the team that if he happened to leave, no one would notice. Kratos and the gang then return to Sindri's home and rest. Atreus doesn't want to waste any time, so he ends up sneaking out at night, and for the first time in the whole franchise, we finally take control of someone other than Kratos. Atreus wants to learn more about Loki, so he wants to go visit Freya. Sindri is very concerned about this idea, so we suggest that he visit Jormungandr instead. Jormungandr isn't very helpful since all he says is Ironwood, and Freya isn't much help either since she might have a grudge against him. Freya is also the reason why the raiders attempted to kill Kratos earlier in the game because she told them that if they killed Kratos, the snow would be gone. Which of course is a lie, but they bought it anyway. Atreus then tells her about how they broke out Tyr and open access to all the other realms, but Freya doesn't want to hear anymore and tells Atreus to leave. This is because of what happens later when Freya comes by and works with Kratos to break the curse. She realizes that she might finally be able to leave Midgard for once, so she needed time to think it over and plan. The only other detail we learn on this trip is about Brock and Sindri, and that's that a long time ago, Brock was killed in an accident when working on the forge. Sindri went to Helheim to get his soul parts back, but only could retrieve three of the four parts, meaning he's not a full person. Now that the realms are open, the group decides that Alfheim is the next step, as Groa Shrine is located there. Groa was the one who foresaw the event of Ragnarok in the first place, so it's possible that the secret story inside the shrine might provide more information on the finer details. Once we enter Alfheim, we see that things are different. Storms have ruined the desert, and Fimblewinter isn't making that any better. As we know from God of War 2018, the Dark Elves fought the Light Elves, and we helped the Light Elves drive them back. But we know that there hasn't been a true victor, as war happens constantly. Back before the conflict, there was just elves. There was even a statue of one in the temple. Once the light of Alfheim was discovered, though, there was a division amongst them. When the Nine Realms were first created, the dead started gathering down here in the Lake of Souls. They then built the Temple of Alfheim around the light in an attempt to harness its energy. Those who became addicted to its power started to worship it, which is how the light elves came to be. The light of Alfheim, though, ruined the precious desert just outside the temple because of the elves' insistence on capturing its power. The Dark Elves faction was then created because of this, because they believe that the natural resources need to stay natural and must not be disturbed. This then led to their long conflict until Freyr came by. 
Freyr, brother of Freya, visited Alfheim and was able to unite the elves and prevent them from fighting. He then ended up leaving Alfheim, though, because of the marriage between Odin and Freya. He returned to Vanaheim in order to protest against their marriage, but once he left, the conflict between the elves was reignited. Inside Groa's shrine, we see her full story. Groa lost her husband at one point and attempted to find him. She meditated to find him, but she ended up finding a vision of the end of the world. This news, of course, reached Odin, so he set out to find her. He was clearly displeased by the information because he killed her shortly after. We then see more Ragnarok stuff, but we learn that it's not a world-ending event. It actually just destroys Asgard, and the other realms thrive in its absence. With that knowledge in mind, the group heads back home again, because they need to plan. There is quite a bit of talk about what Atreus should do in this game, and Kratos doesn't want to hear any of it. You'll be able to recognize who's on whose side, for the most part, based on what they call him. Atreus says that he's not Loki, but Atreus. He sees him as his son, not some prophesized being. Others see him as Loki, like Anger Boda, who Atreus will meet once he goes to bed. We discover though that this isn't some dream like with Faye and Kratos, this is actually happening. He was able to travel here by sleeping. Anger Boda is a giant who lives here in Ironwood, the secret sanctuary. Anger Boda lives here alone since all the giants are dead, or so it seems. According to Anger Boda, her destiny is to show Atreus his destiny. This means that he'll have to read the stone wall from the last game and now knows that Kratos will die. So now it's not about starting Ragnarok, but preventing it, because he doesn't want Kratos to die. Since Kratos is also aware of this prophecy, the two of them know what will happen, but are unaware that the other knows it yet. Anger Boda also shows Atreus where the giants went. They didn't actually die, but rather hid themselves in these small marbles. She assumes that she has all of them, but since Atreus found some in Midgard when visiting the shrines, she realizes this isn't the full set, and that there are more out there. The giants had the option of either waiting for Odin to find a way inside Jotunheim, which would eventually lead to their slaughter, or play dead and hide. They of course opted to play dead and hide. Atreus now has them, and according to her, will know what to do when the time is right. This likely means releasing them back into the world once Odin is dead. One of the marbles in the bag though is Faye's marble, but it's empty so she can't be revived. She however gives it to Atreus, which we can assume would be used on Kratos so that he can save him from his fated death. Engar Boda though becomes a bit angry after this talk, since according to Atreus' panel, she disappears after this conversation, so she'll likely die or fizzle out of his story since she served her purpose. Atreus though won't let that happen, and asks for her to take the marbles and for her to find the other giants, which she of course agrees to. The two of them really start to hit it off quite a bit, and this relates back to the mythology, as Loki and Agnar Boda are actually husband and wife, and their children are Jormungandr, Fenrir, and Hel. But since Loki doesn't exist in God of War, at least not in the traditional sense, their origin was rewritten. Fenrir was just the size of a wolf, but in the myth he's actually quite large. Furthermore, Jormungandr makes an appearance as the snake they rescue together ends up growing at an alarming rate towards the finale. So, like the previous game, Santa Monica is changing the mythology by altering the story, but keeping most of the end results the same. Baldur dies from a mistletoe arrow, but not from it being thrown at him, but by Baldur punching it. Atreus didn't marry Agnar Boda, nor did they create their children, but they do exist, and the chemistry between the two is very apparent as well. Atreus will then say goodbye to Agnar Boda, and wake up at his old home in Midgard. Kratos arrives and the two argue, but they're interrupted by a Valkyrie, who they learn is actually just Freya. Kratos has to control Atreus from biting Freya because his emotions overtook him again just like before. Freya once again contemplates what to do as Kratos still considers her a friend, but they also kill their son. She spares them again because Kratos is more used to her alive. She wants Kratos to go to Vanaheim with her because that is where her curse that keeps her held in Midgard is being hidden. She then assumes the appearance of a bird, which is a neat way around the curse as it was designed to trap Freya, not a bird. The reason she couldn't do this herself was that her abilities are limited as a bird, and because she also needed help breaking the other weaker curses. This help was likely Sigrun, as Freya says that she came to her aid once we freed her last game. Here in Vanaheim is a ragtag group of people, a dwarf, a dark elf, a light elf, and a traveler led by Freyr. Freyr is trying to defend Vanaheim from Odin and his forces, but seeing as there's only five of them, they're not really doing too well. While Mimir and Freyr discuss the battle plans, Freya and Kratos set out in search of the curse. During this journey, Kratos and Freya will talk about their relationship. Kratos will then tell her about the story of his brother Deimos and his tragic backstory. This of course being the time when the God of War Ares tricked him into killing his own wife and daughter. This is rather interesting because he has yet to tell Atreus about these details. Atreus is unaware that Kratos had another wife and child back in Greece and that he killed him, which of course has me wondering if that will ever come up again. As for Deimos, he wasn't mentioned much in the series except for one game where he was the main focal point, Ghost of Sparta. In that story, it's learned that Athena and Ares went to Sparta to find a marked warrior because it was foretold that a marked warrior would bring down Olympus. They assumed it was Deimos because of his notable scar, but we all know that was the wrong choice. Kratos manages to find Deimos, but he is initially angry at him since Kratos never rescued him. Kratos tells this story to Freya because of her conflicted relationship with her brother Freyr. 
Freya and Freya got into a fight during the wedding Freya had with Odin. This was the last time the two spoke, so they left off on a bad note. To be fair though, Freya had every right to hold a grudge against Odin. Odin's an Aesir, and the only reason they ever got married was to stop the war between the Aesir and Vanir, but more importantly, Freya was burned by the Aesir. After the marriage, the Vanir taught the Aesir some of their magic, but because they were brutal and undisciplined people, they often blamed their teachers when things went wrong. Freyr taught some of the Aesir how to improve their crop yields, but when the magic didn't work, they burned him for it. Eventually, Kratos and Freya will then make it to the source of the curse and have to fight Needhog to break it. Needhog protects the Yggdrasil roots from harm, so it's not that Needhog wants to fight us because we're trying to break the curse, but because we're trying to break the roots of the world tree which holds the curse. Once Freya breaks the curse, she's able to travel in her human form, but that also means Kratos is no longer needed. However, thanks to their long talk, she realizes that Kratos isn't the enemy, it's Odin. This means that the two are friends again, and also means that Kratos has another ally willing to help him. We can also help Freya in a future favor quest by going to the marriage temple and getting rid of all the stuff that still has ties to Asgard. It's during this time though that she realizes that she'll never be able to distance herself from Asgard because of Baldur and the Valkyries. She recognizes though that it's not just Odin's realm, but hers too. She was the queen after all. This side quest lets her feel at peace with everything that's happened in her life, which is a touching end to the quest. Now that the task has been completed, Freya and Freya can meet, and since Freya is willing to help us, she can also get a chance to catch up with fake Tyr as well. This may also be hinted at the reveal, as Tyr calls her Frigg. Some of the gods in Norse mythology have different names denoting different things. Freya is a name that represents the Vanir goddess, and Frigg is a name that represents the wife of Odin. They're the same person, just two different names. Odin would of course call her Frigg, but it's subtle enough to not draw any attention because Tyr was an Aesir, so it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for him to call her Frigg as well. Once everyone makes it back to Sindri's house, Kratos talks to Atreus about where he went. He can't reveal anything since he promised Agnar Boda that he wouldn't tell anyone about Ironwood. This then leads to another argument where everyone is questioning if he went to Asgard to meet Odin. He clearly didn't, but ends up going anyway as his emotions overcome him again and he storms out of the house, but not before injuring Sindri. Atreus then arrives in Midgard and makes his way to Freya's old home. When inside, a raven will enter which means that Odin is watching. He then talks to the raven and asks it to take him to Asgard. The bird accepts and throws him just outside the wall. Just in case you're confused about this decision, Atreus wants to go here because he wants to work with and against Odin. He wants to prevent Ragnarok because it'll kill Kratos, but he can't do that cooped up in the house all day. Plus, Kratos won't let him leave so he has to do this alone against his wishes. That's why he goes to Asgard, with the hope that by working with Odin, he can find answers about Loki and stop Ragnarok. Thankfully, Odin wants the same thing. He doesn't care about Ragnarok as he only cares about this tear. According to Odin, this tear holds knowledge and truth. It will allow him to change his fate, prevent Ragnarok, and save people. The problem though is that he can't look into it because when he did, he lost his eye. Mimir in the last game explains that when he first met Odin, he told him that he could see visions in this well. It was really just a regular well filled with magical mushrooms, but apparently he did see something in it. Whether or not it was real due to the mushrooms is unclear, but it was enough for Odin to dedicate his whole life to it. He's been trying to open it and understand it for lifetimes, but hasn't gotten anywhere. Atreus, though, is able to help him as he can translate what is written on the mask, so the two work together to uncover its secrets. The underlying issue, though, is that it's Odin. Odin, when talking with Atreus, will say that mortals can look to the gods for answers. They can also go to Valhalla or Vanaheim when they die. Their lives continue after death, but that's for mortals. What about gods? They can't look to higher beings for answers because they are the higher beings. And because they're different, they don't know what will happen when they die. Back in 2018, when we killed Magni and Modi, Atreus questioned why the Valkyries didn't come pick them up yet. The afterlife for gods may be different or even non-existent. While all of us here have our opinions on the afterlife, we don't have definitive proof. Nobody has actually been to heaven in return, so we can't say for certain. That's why some believe in gods and others don't. The same question about what happens after death is the one Odin is asking, but he might actually have the answer if he looks through the tear. It's a normal dream and ambition to have, and it almost makes you look at Odin differently, but we also have to remember he's a pathological liar and manipulator, so preventing Ragnarok could just mean killing everyone that isn't Aesir. And changing his fate might just mean never being killed since he'll always know how he dies. It's hard to understand what his true intentions are. He could be genuine, but he could not be. On our way to meet Odin, Atreus will come across Thor, his family, and Heimdall. Heimdall is the Watcher of the Gods and has the power to know people's intentions, which is why he can't be hit. He knows what you will do and can react accordingly. It's not that he can see into the future like the giants, he can only see their intentions, so if someone is angry and plans to swing at him, he'll notice ahead of time and dodge it. Heimdall is also the owner of the Gallarhorn. Despite what you may think, it is not actually an exotic rocket launcher, but just a real horn. This is the horn that starts the Battle of Ragnarok and he is the keeper of it. As for Thor's family, we have Thrud and Sif. Thrud is the daughter of Thor and a sister to Magni and Modi. Sif is their mother and Thor's wife, but sadly not much is known about her. Her main claim to fame is her long golden hair, but that's about it. 
Sif and Thrud get into arguments quite a bit because Thrud wants to become a Valkyrie, but Sif forbids her from doing so. It's learned later that Sif did indeed want her to be a Valkyrie after all, just not under Odin's rule since Odin is a very harsh ruler. Oddly enough, in the myth, Thrud does exist, but there's also a Valkyrie with the same name as her that serves ale to the warriors of Valhalla, but it's always been unclear whether or not they're the same person or just have the same name. So who knows, maybe her dream will come true after all. Atreus at one point will walk with Odin and we can see the world through his eyes. We see three Valkyries, Hrist and Mist, as well as the new Valkyrie Queen Gana. We also see how much power Odin has over the Dwarves since Falterfein because his requests are very demanding and he is unwilling to compromise on them. When the two go back to Odin's room, Atreus finds a sword that moves on its own called Ingrid. This is actually Freyr's signature weapon, but he left it here. I will circle back to this in a bit. Back to the task at hand, Odin wants Atreus to find the other two mask pieces. After translating the first part, they determine it's in Muspelheim, so he asks Atreus to take Thor with him. Atreus then distracts Thor by telling him he could participate in the Trials of Surtur, which he did in the last game. Thor of course agrees, because killing is fun to him, which allows Atreus to look into Surtur's shrine here in Muspelheim. He's not the only one though who wanted to look inside as Agarboda is here and says that she's still looking for more marbles. Surtur is a fire giant and it's prophesied that during Ragnarok, Surtur is the one that breaks down the walls of Asgard. To do that though, Surtur and his wife Sinmara are supposed to join together and become Ragnarok. Once he learns this information, Atreus leaves just in time for Thor to finish killing. They then find the mask and report back to Odin. Atreus is now tasked with translating the final piece, but before that happens, we are sent back to Kratos and set off on his journey, which as we discover is to find the Norns. The Norns are the Norse versions of the Fates. Similar to the ones from Greece, they're three sisters who know the fate of the world and its inhabitants. The Norns say though that they know what they will do because they don't change. The Norns aren't omniscient beings that know anything and everything. They know what will happen because of people's predictable choices. Baldur was destined to die a needless death, and he did. Freya couldn't let her son go, and thus made him invincible. Baldur couldn't control his rage and vowed to kill Freya the next time they met, and Kratos is a god killer. All of their predictable choices led to the death of Baldur. The final line Erd says really puts it well. She says that they are the sum of their choices, and because their choices never change, Ragnarok will start. So to prevent Ragnarok, they must change. They then leave the land of the Norns, but not before taking a noose with them, which is the noose Odin hanged himself with lifetimes ago. He one day decided to hang himself from the world tree for nine whole days in his quest to find the secrets of the world. Once they return home, they all discuss what to do about Heimdall, as the Norns claim that Heimdall will kill Atreus. He has heightened senses, so Brock thinks that overloading them will work. To do that though, they need Dropnir. In the myth, Brock and Sindri competed against the sons of Ivaldi to see who could make the better gift for the gods. Ivaldi's sons created Gungir, Odin's spear, a silk scarf that transforms into a boat called Skidbladnir, which we'll see later when we meet Freyr again, and long golden hair for Sif because Loki got drunk one night and cut it off. Brock and Sindri made Mjolnir, which won them the contest, Gulenbursti, which is a golden boar that drives Freyr's chariot, and Dropnir, a magical ring that makes eight other rings every nine days. This was a gift for Odin, but Sindri has it here in his house, which means he stole it from Odin one day. They keep the ring down here though because they would melt down the rings they would make and use it for their projects. Brock believes that if they use this and make a spear, he should be able to kill Heimdall. To craft this weapon though, they'll need to go to Svartalfheim and meet the Lady of the Forge. The Lady is a mermaid and uses the ingredients as well as Kratos' blood to craft the spear they need to defeat Heimdall. But when Brock asks her to bless it, she doesn't respond, or at least doesn't seem to. Mermaids don't talk physically, they communicate by talking to a person's soul, but since Brock is missing a fourth of his soul, he can't hear her. That's when he learns about the truth of what happened that day at the forge. Before they could leave Svartalfheim and go home, Odin and the two talk. Similar to their previous talk, Odin still wants peace and doesn't want war, but one line that sticks out is when he talks about what Kratos knows about godhood. He asks if anyone actually worshipped him, and if he even cares about mortals. Honestly, it's a fair question. The only people who praised Kratos as a god were the Spartan warriors as they prayed for assistance in their battles, but that was it. Kratos has never truly been worshipped as a god before, and everyone in Greece died eventually so it doesn't even matter anymore. Kratos is now just a god of no renown. After some time, Kratos decides to return home and call it a night. We then get another dream of Faye and Kratos as they take a trip down the river before Faye tells him to protect their son. We can see a lot of emotion from Kratos in this scene, and a lot of others as well. He's terrified of losing Atreus, and at times is almost on the verge of tears because of it. We then go back to Atreus and see that he, Thrud, and Skogir are talking. Skogir is actually from Midgard. In the previous game, we heard a bit about something called the Desolation. When that happened, Odin took those who survived and brought them here to Asgard. They aren't inside the wall of Asgard, they're not that special, but they do live right outside the wall, which I guess is close enough. Atreus then meets with Odin and tells him that the final piece is in Helheim. He is then sent off to Helheim with Thrud and Heimdall as company. Heimdall is here to retrieve the moon, which is what leads to the future events in Vanaheim, but before that happens, we need to follow this new duo to their destination. The mask points him to this place in Helheim where Garm the Hellhound is located. 
Atreus ends up freeing Garm because he cares for animals and believes that it wants to be free. This is very problematic, as Garm has the power to open realm tears anywhere he wants. Garm being loose is a problem for anyone, no matter the location or realm they reside in. Atreus is so upset by this that he decides he wants to go home, and he doesn't want to do this anymore. Atreus might also be a bit homesick, as it's been a long time since he's seen his friends. Surprisingly, Odin is not mad at him. He's disappointed because he screwed up big time, but he knows that Atreus is important to his mission, so he comforts him instead, telling them that he is still welcome in Asgard if he ever wants to come back. Atreus then makes it back to Sindri's home, and he and Kratos hug it out. After learning what happened, everyone is rightfully upset, except Kratos, who's just happy to see Atreus again. The two then battle Garm multiple times before Atreus takes the knife and stabs Garm, replacing his soul with Fenrir, which explains within the God of War series how Fenrir got to his gigantic size. Before they return home though, the two probably have the most important conversation in the game. Kratos has started to recognize how much he slipped back into his old ways. He's angry and distrustful of Atreus, and he doesn't want to be. Atreus assures him though that without Kratos, he would have been reckless and stupid. The two then promise that they will listen to each other's voices in their heads whenever they're gone. Kratos finally comes to accept Atreus' curiosity and apologizes for his behavior. They then return to the house again, and Kratos decides not to kill Heimdall. He wants to be better not just for himself, but for Atreus, and killing Heimdall would go against that. Freya takes off though because Vanaheim is under attack by Odin's forces, so she's going to help them. Once the two eventually make it there, they'll be ambushed by an archer named Hildas Vini, who you'll recognize as the boar Atreus shot in the last game. He was exiled to Midgard in his boar form, but it seems that now he's able to return to his human form now. Kratos and Atreus then do exactly as the Skull and Hati Shrine prophesies by getting the moon back and shooting an arrow into the sky so that the world can go back to normal. The group then realize that Freya has been captured so they devise a plan, but is interrupted once Heimdall arrives. Despite the fact that an hour ago he said he wouldn't kill him, Kratos does it anyway. This is not only problematic for Kratos because he's going against what he said, but also because Asgard will hear about this soon and the truce they had will now be over. Kratos didn't exactly accept the truce in the first place, but Odin honored it anyway. Now that's over. Kratos and company rescue Freya before using his boat and take it to the sky. The group ends up being attacked, and Birger has to sacrifice himself in order to save them. He's not actually dead though, as you could find him later in a side quest, but it is still a pretty cool moment. Since Freya's injured, Freya has to take him to where her herbs are in order to heal him, so it's back to the house again. Atreus steps up this time and asks if he can go back to Asgard. His plan is to complete the mask and then somehow get out before Ona can get it back. After some time, they agree, but are of course very worried. News of Heimdall's death has reached Asgard, but Atreus is fine for now. He reports back to Odin and tells him that he mistranslated the mask and that it's actually in Niflheim. This is a bit strange since the mask only glows in the direction of the other mask parts, so how is it glowing in Helheim if it wasn't there to begin with? Personally, I'm not too sure how that's possible, but regardless, Odin suggests Atreus take Thor, but Thor is currently drinking the pain away and can't really operate. This leads to an incredible bar fight, which seems to sober him up a bit. Thor and Atreus then find the mask, but Sif arrives with the two Valkyries as they have proof that Kratos killed Heimdall. Odin tells her to stand down, but Sif talks Thor into fighting as she reminds him that Atreus and Kratos are to blame for the death of their sons. Thankfully, Atreus is able to escape before things get too crazy thanks to a stone Sindri gave him before he left. I think you know where Atreus ends up going next, and once he gets there, the group talks about their next step, since the last problem they have left is, you know, actually getting to Asgard. Tyr claims to know a way, but is questioned as to why he withheld that information, which leads to the reveal of Odin and the death of Brock. Brock passes away, Odin escapes, and Sindri leaves with Brock's body. This then starts Ragnarok. They all realize that war needs to happen, and they can't just avoid it. Freya goes to recruit the elves, Freya goes to visit the Valkyries, Hildisvini and Mimir go to recruit the Legion of Helheim, and Kratos and Atreus go to find Surtur so that he can destroy the wall. Surtur, though, does not want to partake in the action, though, because it would mean the death of his wife, but opts to sacrifice just himself through a loophole that he just discovered. Instead of combining as the prophecy says, he just uses Kratos' blades to heat Samara's heart that's in his chest, which should work. Fortunately for them, it does, but the two have to defeat Hrist and Mist down here at the Spark of the World. Once they finish the job, they go to Tyr's temple and set up a camp as they prepare for war. Kratos gets one last dream with Faye and tells Atreus a story. The story is about a man who would carry wood for the village. He started getting weaker over time though and he called for death to come to him. To me, this story is supposed to be about Kratos since in a few hours from now he's prophesied to die and has accepted that fate. He's fought dozens of gods and hasn't felt complete peace for years. It's always been about fighting or hiding. He's also still reminded of his misdeed because the ashes are still on his skin. I don't think those bad memories are as potent as they were back in Greece, but it's still there nonetheless. Kratos will live, of course, which is why the story gets retold again, and it's discovered that the man realized that he wanted to keep living, so he decided to continue carrying wood for the village. Kratos wants to live and be there for his son. He even said earlier in the game that death can have him when it earns it. Clearly, it hasn't. 
As for the dream, it takes place around the time him and Faye were out setting up the trees and her markings, and also when she tells him how she wants to be burned and have her ashes spread atop the highest peak in all the realms. Kratos then wakes up, gathers the group, and blows the horn, signaling the start of Ragnarok. As they enter through the portal, they see all the destruction that has already started. Jormungandr, Fenrir, and Anger Boda will also join the battle a bit later. This Jormungandr, though, is not the old one, but rather the new one that Atreus found back in Jotunheim. We'll also see Thor attack him, which is how he gets sent back in time, and then meets the group again back in 2018. In order for Surtur, now Ragnarok, to actually destroy the wall, the group needs to get rid of the war machines holding it back. It's around this time, though, that they discover that Odin was using the Midgardians he saved from the Desolation as fodder since he knew they wouldn't kill them. Kratos has always told Atreus to close his heart to death so that it doesn't affect him, but that's when he realizes he's wrong. That's what the old Kratos would have done. So he instead tells him to open his heart, take in all that grief and pain, because today they will be better. Kratos also decides not to use Ragnarok and instead use Himmethor's flaw. This was a tale that was told back in the last game about how the builder of the wall left a flaw in the wall for when Ragnarok starts so that they can breach Asgard. Sindri and Atreus then run into Thrud, who almost kills him but backs down when she realizes that Atreus is telling the truth and that Odin is the real villain here. She and Atreus will join Kratos and head inside before being attacked by Thor. Thor of course loses, but is spared because Kratos has changed. Older Kratos, not just Greek Kratos, but even earlier Kratos from the introduction, would have easily killed him without mercy. But this journey has changed his outlook on a lot of things. Sadly, none of that matters as Odin finishes Thor for him. This leads to a lengthy boss fight with Odin. Odin, of course, just like Thor, loses, but we see that during their talk, Atreus ends up breaking the mask, which gets sucked into the tear, and now that, and all of its possible knowledge, is gone forever. Odin then loses and gets killed by Atreus as he puts his soul into the ball that was meant for Kratos. This could have possibly led to a future plot in which Odin escapes and is set free, but Sindri isn't having any of that and just smashes it to pieces, killing Odin for good. Surtur then comes crashing in, but thankfully Freyr is able to fend him off, just long enough for the group to escape on Fenrir, but Freyr had to sacrifice himself in order to do so. This is fascinating to me, because in the myth, Freyr dies to Surtur because he didn't have his sword, but here he dies even with it. Freyr didn't have his sword because he left it behind once he married a woman named Gerd. Because of that, Freyr at one point had to use an antler to kill a giant, which is the same weapon he wields when we meet him, so it's a nice nod to both events. Everyone except Freyr manages to survive, and Atreus is woken up by air. As Atreus, we could talk to some of the survivors, and at the very top are Engerboda and Kratos. Engerboda says that she has something for the two of them. Inside this cave is a panel. The real panel. The prophecy we saw on the walls was what the giants wanted. They wanted Loki to come and defeat Odin. But Faye went against her own kind. She destroyed Atreus's panel in Jotunheim so that they didn't know their fate. She wanted her family to make her own choices and shape their own destiny. Since Atreus's panel is broken though, he is able to make his own fate, and that's when he talks with Kratos about his plan to find the other giants. To do this though, he will have to go alone, because he believes that he needs to do this himself. Kratos agrees because of their talk during Ragnarok and back in Helheim, and lets his son go. It's sort of like a parent letting their kid go and live on their own. When they're a child, you can be with them for as long as you want, but now that they're older, they have to live their own life. Kratos couldn't accept that because he was worried Atreus would get into trouble or worse when he left, and, well, to be fair, he did release Garm, go to Asgard, and search for Tyr all on his own, which didn't really help his case. But Kratos and Atreus have changed for the better, and they both recognize that. Atreus loves Kratos and all he's done for him, from discipline to training to just being a father, and Kratos is proud of Atreus and the man he's turning into. It's a perfect ending to their once fractured relationship. This, however, isn't even the best part, as Kratos gets another look at the panel and finds one behind it. This panel is Kratos's, and he's finally done it. The panel shows a golden Kratos, being worshipped as a god. It's unclear if it's as the god of war or just a hero, but he's finally being appreciated. And judging by his reaction, this is something he's wanted for ages. Also, and it's a bit of a stretch, but there's no white in that picture. It could just simply be a stylistic choice, but maybe the ashes will be gone. Kratos may finally get the peace he fought tooth and nail to have. Kratos the god killer, the one who killed dozens of gods and hundreds of creatures for revenge, will finally be worshipped as a hero. He will no longer be remembered as the ghost of Sparta, murderer and god killer of Greece, but as Kratos, the one who saved the Nine Realms. And I couldn't have asked for a better ending. To get to this path though, Kratos has lots of work to do, which for the player means finishing up any content they missed. Just like in God of War 2018, there are some secret things we can find after the game is finished. If you go to Niflheim and take a left before the Raven Tree, you can find a prison cell that has the real tear in it. It's hypothesized that this is where Odin held those he transformed into. This obviously makes sense since without it there would have been two tears running loose and that would have blown his cover. If you go to Alfheim, you can see Thrud sitting next to Mjolnir before taking off into the sky, so it seems like she'll be wielding the weapon for the foreseeable future. Ratatoskr will provide Kratos with more Yggdrasil seeds, meaning more gateways are open like the one in Jotunheim. Sadly, all you can do is talk to Angerboda and pet Fenrir. 
You can also visit Charlie again, and if you manage to complete the favor quest through Rescuer Bierger, then you can actually tell him to retire here instead. While in Vanaheim, you can also talk to Sif and Hilda Zvini, who are coming up with plans on how the Aesir and Vanir could coexist. In Mugspelheim, you can also challenge Valkyrie Queen Gana. Fortunately, you don't have to go through eight other Valkyries to kill her like Sigrun. Unfortunately, though, she's just as tough as Sigrun. After all that, though, the only thing left to do is to visit Svalterfheim and partake in Brock's funeral. Durlin, Rabe, Lunda, and Sindri are here as well, and they give Brock a Viking funeral. It's a sweet and really touching moment, and we can hear Kratos call him friend. Brock's death really did affect him a lot, and it also affects Sindri a lot too. We see that Sindri's armor is still stained, and when we return to the house, the leaves of the World Tree are all over the floor. Sindri is a clean freak, but Brock's death has changed him a lot. He hasn't even taken care of himself yet. Hopefully, though, Sindri will be able to return to his more chipper self over time. Once the funeral is given, though, the credits will roll, which signals the end of God of War Ragnarok. As always, we now have to ask, what comes next? And honestly, I don't know. We don't know what the Realm of Creation thing was in Odin's basement, and Athena's existence is still unclear. Usually, we could look towards a specific scene that teases some of the future events, like God of War 3's ending, but we don't have one in this game. This could honestly be the final game in the series. If I recall, Ragnarok should be the final Norse game, but there are no hints given in this game that another will happen, so who knows, God of War might just end here. God of War could also continue, but under Atreus instead of Kratos, since his story is just beginning. It's also possible that they could wrap up Atreus' current journey in a DLC, but none of the other God of War games have ever released DLC before, so I highly doubt Santa Monica Studios would start now. Either way, whatever happens, we'll just have to wait and see. Let me know what you thought about God of War Ragnarok in the comments down below, and while you're down there, if you have any questions, feel free to comment them, and I will try to clarify any confusion you may have. While you're here, just a reminder that I have a lot of story reviews that you might be interested in, like the one on the entire God of War series. But if you enjoyed this video, then be sure to leave a like and subscribe. As always, thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and take care everyone. Goodbye.